When it comes to retirement planning, the most important decision that you will make is choosing what funds to invest in. Pick well and you could find yourself retiring early. Pick poorly and you could find your life savings stagnating for years with no growth at all. Clearly, if you want to build your own investment portfolio, you're going to have to find a way to identify which funds to invest in and which to avoid. But even if you're just paying into a company pension, you're also going to need to get your head around this because the default funds that you are automatically invested in are often not fit for purpose and you'll need to make changes. So in this video, I'm going to take you on a journey as I analyze four different funds to illustrate the three big mistakes investors make when picking funds. Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is James. I am a financial planner and this is a place where you can learn to make smarter financial decisions. Whether you're building a portfolio of funds or you're just trying to find one fund to invest in, the hunt for the perfect one can be long and technical. But today I want to show you the three big mistakes that everyone makes when they start picking funds. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. To do this, we're going to analyze four different funds from the eyes of a novice investor to see just how easy it is to fall into these traps. I will be talking about specific funds, but it's important to remember that I am not suggesting that any of these funds are the best in class or that they are the best for you. They're simply there to help visualize these mistakes. These funds that we'll be looking at are available from most UK-based investing platforms. If you're not in the UK, don't worry, because you will find exactly the same type of funds wherever you are. And the lessons that you are about to learn apply globally. So these are the four funds that we're going to look at. First up, iShares S&P 500 ETF. Now, whenever you're trying to research a fund, the first place you want to head for is the funds fact sheet. And from this, we can see that this fund seeks to track the performance of an index composed of 500 large cap US companies. And then we have another passive fund, the Vanguard Global All Cap Fund, that seeks to track the performance of the FTSE Global All Cap Index, which just tells us that this global index fund invests across all countries and in companies of all sizes. Then we have two actively managed funds, Fundsmith and Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust. Now, unlike passive funds that are typically run by a computer, actively managed funds are run by a fund management team who try to use their skill to invest in companies that they think will outperform the market. Fundsmith Equity invests in high quality companies on a global basis, and its benchmark is the MSCI World Index, which is just another global index. Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust, which actually has nothing to do with Scotland or mortgages, but instead aims to maximize total return over the long term from investment primarily in shares of companies from across the globe and uses the FTSE All World Index as a benchmark. So we have the S&P 500, a global index fund, and then two actively managed funds that are trying to beat that global index fund. But how do we tell which one is the best? Where do we even start? Fees? Yes, fees are actually very important. In fact, they're considered to be one of the most reliable predictors of a fund's future performance. As this Morningstar analysis shows, between 2010 and 2015, the US equity funds with the lowest fees beat their benchmark 62% of the time, whilst those with the most expensive only beat the market 22% of the time. This is a finding that has proved to be consistent across time, where funds with the lowest fees tend to have the best performance. So let's start with fees. On the funds fact sheet, the figure that you're looking for is the OCF, or the ongoing charge figure. This is the fund's fixed costs, but to get the total cost, we also need to add in the transaction fees that are generated by the fund's trading activity. So clearly, the two actively managed funds are the most expensive, and the S&P 500 is the cheapest but that's not really enough information for us to make our decision. So what's next? We've got a shed load of information on these fact sheets, but what data other than fees is going to help us make a decision? What data on this page are you drawn towards? I know what you're thinking, performance. How well have these funds done in the past? Because who cares what the fees are so long as it gets good returns, right? Well, let's take a look. Over this five-year period, the S&P 500 returned 110%. The Global All Cap Fund returned 68%. 
Fundsmith returned 120%, and S&P returned, wait for it, 325%. That is just insane. It's got the same benchmark as Fundsmith and the Vanguard Fund, and yet it's returned five times more than the market. So based on this, which do you think is the best fund? Seems pretty clear to me. You can't argue with that performance. Or can you? You see, past performance is the number one factor that investors use to select funds. And it's not just beginners who do this. There's plenty of evidence that shows that big pension funds select managers based on their past performance. But it's almost impossible not to. Performance is what we're all here for, right? And if a fund is not performing, then what the hell is it doing? I mean, you're clearly not going to invest in a fund that's been underperforming, right? Well, this is the big trap that all investors fall into, and it often ends up with dire consequences. To understand why, we're first going to need to understand more about SMT and why it has achieved these returns. From its fact sheet, it looks like an ordinary global fund. It's got a global benchmark and it's got a risk score of six out of seven, one notch above a global index fund. But what it actually invests in is very different. Of late, SMT has become a highly concentrated investor in high risk, high growth companies. Its top 10 holdings include vaccine maker Moderna, Elon Musk's companies Tesla and SpaceX, and Chinese companies Tencent and Neo. This is a highly concentrated portfolio of high growth technology stocks with the potential for high returns, but also very high risks. But over the last five years, whilst interest rates have been low and cash freely available, this investing theme has done extremely well. In fact, the vast majority of funds that invest in this way have done very well too. But we need to remember that every investing style will eventually have its time in the sun, whether that's tech stocks or commodities, property or healthcare. Each theme has had periods where it's performed spectacularly well followed by long periods when they don't. The problem with thematic investing is that these funds are more or less stuck with their particular investing style, which they can't change out of even if they did think that they were going to underperform. So even though you're paying these fund managers a pretty big fee, the most important decision of whether now is a good time to invest in this style or not still sits with you. Now, I know that a lot of you will actually be invested in this fund because it's one of the most popular funds in the UK. And if you are invested, you'll know what I'm about to say. The performance that I just showed you was actually up until the start of this year. But since that point, S&T has fallen by almost 50 percent. And if you've been holding this fund, I bet you've been kicking yourself thinking, if only I had sold out sooner. But you should not feel bad about it because timing the market like this is incredibly hard to do. I know I can't do it, very few people can, but the difference is that I know I can't do it. So I make sure not to put myself in the position where I have to make decisions that I am not qualified to make. So what about Fundsmith? Despite its high fees, Fundsmith is the second best performer and unlike SMT, it's not concentrated in just one theme. It holds itself out as a fund that you can buy and hold for the long term. And as we can see from this data, it has done its job. It's beaten the Vanguard Index Fund and it's beaten the S&P 500. In fact, Fundsmith has performed exceptionally well ever since its exception in 2010. There's a lot of evidence here that suggests that this is a very skilled fund manager. And if this is the case, we should expect this outperformance to continue. But what if he's not skilled? What if he just got lucky. You see, the problem with active managers is that even when they have a long track record of outperformance, it's very hard for us to tell whether this is down to their skill or just dumb luck. These are the results of a study that looked back at how 3,000 actively managed US funds have performed over the last 19 years to assess how many of them were successful at beating their benchmarks. And when we look back at the funds with a full 19 year track record, we can see that over 50% of them were able to beat the market. And when you log into your investment account, whichever investment platform you're using, you're often presented with a curated list of these top performing funds with the longest track records. But this data is 
deceiving because it only includes the funds that survived the full 19 years. When in fact, most active funds were shut down during the period due to poor returns, which creates a survivorship bias that makes it seem like there's lots of great funds out there, but actually that's only because most of them have been shut down and only 22% of these funds were actually able to beat the market. Now, Fundsmith is clearly a member of this group, but the problem is that even over a 20 year period, we would expect a significant number of funds to still be outperforming just due to random luck. Imagine instead that we replaced these 3,000 sophisticated fund managers with 3,000 chimpanzees and had them pick stocks by throwing darts at a dartboard. Over 20 years, we would still expect a significant number of these chimps to be outperforming just due to random luck. But as with all games of luck, their luck would eventually run out and their performance would revert back to the mean. Just like in a game of heads and tails, perhaps you start off throwing loads of tails in a row, but we all know that if you play the game for long enough, the score will revert back towards the mean of 50-50. If Fundsmith's performance is genuinely due to the skill of that manager, then we would expect it to continue. But if they've just got lucky, we would expect that luck to soon run out with them seeing years of underperformance as they revert back towards the mean. And there is evidence of this occurring all the time. In a 2015 paper called Does Past Performance Matter in Investment Manager Selection, they conducted a test to assess whether a fund's performance over the last three years was a good indicator of future returns. In this, they constructed three portfolios a winner portfolio that contained the top performing 10% of funds from the last three years, a median portfolio that contained the middle 45 to 55% of funds, and a loser portfolio that invested in the bottom 10% of funds. Now, actually, all three of these strategies underperformed the market. The losers underperformed by 0.11%. The median underperformed by 1.07% and the winner strategy underperformed by 2.39% per year. This evidence suggests that the majority of these top performing funds are not there due to their skill. It's just luck. But what's worse is that even if you can find a very skilled manager that can consistently produce market beating returns, we would expect that that success would attract more and more investors, leading to their fund to grow larger and larger and larger in size. And as a fund grows in size, it becomes much harder to manage. In a 2016 paper, Does Scale Impact Skill? They found that as a fund grows in size, its ability to produce excess returns diminishes to the extent that in theory, even the most skilled fund manager in the world would eventually see their fund get to a size where they are unable to produce excess returns net of their fees. This fact is widely accepted within the fund management community and is why some funds put a cap on their size, but most don't because the larger the fund gets, the more they earn in fees even if it means that their investors' returns suffer as a consequence. The average size of a fund in the UK is 550 million, but due to their exceptional past performance, Fundsmith and SMT have ballooned in size over the years to where as of 2021, Fundsmith had 22 billion under management and Scottish Mortgage had 18 billion. And as it happens, since Fundsmith's rapid growth, it's actually started to underperform the market over the last three years. So even if we were able to identify which managers are actually skillful, we would have to invest in them before they get big, which means investing in them before they've had good returns or when they've only had a very short track record, which is nigh on impossible to do. Unless of course you get very lucky. These are the reasons why I think investing with active managers is very, very risky and why instead we should be investing in passive funds that simply track the market. So now we're down to just two funds, the S&P 500 and the global all cap. Now, clearly the S&P 500 has outperformed over this period. In fact, US stocks have outperformed international stocks for well over 10 years now. And many people think that this is likely to continue and is why they only invest in US companies. But let me show you why that might not be such a good idea. Here we're looking at the makeup of global equity markets. The US is the biggest market by far at almost 
60%. Interestingly, the UK only makes up about 4% of global stocks. Now, if we invested in a global index fund, we would get an allocation that looks roughly like this, spread out across the world, but still with a significant portion invested in the US. But if we invested in this passive S&P 500 fund, we are betting that US companies will continue to outperform everything else. But assuming that past trends will continue on into the future is extremely risky. Because if I take you back to 1989, the global stock market looked very different. In 1989, Japan made up 45% of global stocks. The Japanese market was far larger than the US and Japan was seen to be the hot place to invest. In the 1980s, it was Sony, Honda and Fujitsu that were household names, just like Microsoft and Apple are today. But times change. And over the last 30 years, Japan's stock market has performed terribly. In fact, it's only just recovered back to its previous peak. Now, I'm not suggesting that the US of today is facing the same challenges that Japan did in the 90s. But by investing in this passive S&P 500 fund, you are actually making a massive active bet on the US continuing to outperform the rest of the world. You're also only investing in the very largest US companies. You're not getting exposure to small or medium-sized businesses, which history tells us have been the main drivers of growth over the long term. So we're left with just one fund, a passive global index fund that invests across all countries and in companies of all sizes. You'll notice that the lessons that we've learned today are not specific to these particular funds. In fact, we could have subbed in any fund from within the same category and we would have got the same results. The big takeaway here is that for most investors, past performance is the most important data point that they can use to decide what funds to invest in. But as we've seen, chasing returns often has terrible consequences. Now, I'm not suggesting that this Vanguard fund is the best fund out there or that it's the best fund for you. In fact, most people that are watching this video would have a terrible experience if they invested in this fund. And if you want to learn exactly why that is and what else you need to consider when picking a fund, you should watch this video here where I take you through it step by step. I'll see you there.